Yeah, Je Jesse always talks me up a little bit, but I am also actually a very nervous, like stand behind the podium kind of guy also. So I'm probably gonna stay right here and uh, tell you about Code for Tulsa, which is our Code for America Brigade over in Tulsa, and a little bit about why we build uh, for the web. <clears throat> but before I start that, so does anyone recognize or remember who these guys are? This uh, is Jake England and Alvin Watts. Now, you probably are going to remember them here in a second. On Good Friday in 2012, uh, they shot and killed three black victims in North Tulsa. This was called the Good Friday shootings in the media. That story probably made it over here and made it around. So um, keep that in mind for a second, and uh, we'll get back to that. Okay. So let me tell you about uh, our Code for Tulsa story. The only way I know how to do that is to tell you kind of my story about it. So I'm a husband, dad, a soccer fan, I'm a home brewer. Uh, and when I'm not doing that stuff, I'm a web developer and manager uh, for Mozilla Developer Network. And I co-founded Tulsa Web Devs, uh, working on a startup called Codesy, and of course, our Code for Tulsa brigade. Uh, my path into Code for America started kind of way back uh, at an O'Reilly OSCON in 2008. So Tim O'Reilly gave a keynote message that basically said, you know, work on stuff that matters. Because um, at that time, one of the hottest things, you know, developers made was this thing called Superpoke. It was like a Facebook app that let you like sucker punch and grope your friends or something. It's totally stupid and Facebook bought this crap for $50 million. So everyone was cashing in on like frivolous software, right? Like nine out of the top 10 iPhone apps were games, probably still true today. The only non-game was this eye beer that let you like, you know, drink your phone or something. <laughs> like this. So Tim's question to us software developers was pretty simple. Like, are we working on the right things, right? So through the last six years, uh, that question really drives what I do in my career and my profession and just my trade as a software developer. <clears throat> so years later, but still many years ago, I joined uh, Mozilla as a web developer. And Mozilla is a pretty amazing place if you want to work on the right things that matter. So we're a small nonprofit uh, with a global volunteer community of web designers and programmers, uh, engineers, tinkerers, just you know people who do things a little bit different. Uh, and our mission is to promote openness, innovation, and opportunity on the web. So everyone knows us for the Firefox web browser. Uh, so these days, we're also building the principles of Firefox into mobile with Firefox for Android and Firefox OS. Uh, and we build like online learning tools like WebMaker, which is helping people learn how to make the web instead of just consume it. Um, but when I joined Mozilla, I learned that our executive director, this guy Mark Sermon, gave a presentation at a Toronto 2.0 summit back in 2008. Um, he said Mozilla bet that openness and participation could create a better internet and then asked Toronto city leaders if openness and participation could create a better city. So I had been now sort of trying to improve my city um, by starting a group called Tulsa Web Devs. Um, we're a typical developer group. We present web development topics each month. We go to like regional tech events like this one. Um, we have monthly meetings as mostly as an excuse to like eat pizza and drink beer and geek out on web stuff. Um, at one of those meetings, we wondered why isn't Tulsa Transit on Google Maps, right? Like what does it take to get data onto Google Maps and could we do that? So we had our very first hack day. Uh, we got some transit schedule data from an organization called NCOG. We got transit route data from a contractor who smuggled it out on a USB stick. Uh, <laughs> we kind of poured over the Google GTFS docs. Um, we left with no code, but we had a really good understanding of the problem. A month later, we had another hack night. Uh, this time we had more data, a much better understanding of what we needed to do. And by the end of it, John and Jeremy had built a working prototype. So they had converted enough of the data to pass Google's validator tool. So of course, we went to Sound Pony and had beers to celebrate. Um, a few months later, we had kind of a full-on hackathon. And NCOG proposed a couple more civic apps for us. One was this call or click app for out of service residents to request uh, special transit trips. Another app combined data from the city website with the Oklahoma Department of Transportation's traffic advisories and showed it all to you and that kind of thing. Uh, this all happened in 2011. Um, and by the end of that year, 
I was feeling kind of reflective and I came across an interview with uh, Jeff Hammerbacher. So he actually started Facebook's data analytics department. So when you hear about big data, they're tracking you, all that stuff, like he, that's, that's his fault. Um, but he said something then that reminded me of Tim O'Reilly's message. The best minds of our generation are thinking about how to make people click ads. Like, that sucks, right? Um, it's still largely true today, but he's actually gone on to found Cloudera and they use big data to like cure cancer and stuff now, so. Um, but the next month I signed us up for Code for America Brigade. Uh, they wanted two brigade captains, so I volunteered John here. Um, I don't think he knew what he was getting into. But uh, I didn't know much about it. It seemed to kind of fit the stuff we were already doing. Um, and I've watched Jennifer Polka's TED Talk, so you should go check this out. Um, I felt all that inspiration kind of coming back to me, right? Uh, for developers to work on stuff that matters. And so I began to read more about Code for America. I actually learned that Jennifer was at um, the same OSCON that I was at and had taken Tim O'Reilly's work on stuff that matters and started Code for America because of that. Um, as a nonprofit to really recruit software developers uh, to use their coding skills to create better government in their communities. So Code for America, the main thing they started with was they recruit fellows. These are civic-minded product developers, designers. Um, they form teams. They partner with local governments for a year. Uh, the post, they kind of built one of the poster child civic apps uh, for the city of Boston. So when there's a big snowstorm, fire hydrants in Boston get covered up with snow. Um, when there's a fire, firefighters have to dig hydrants out of the snow before they can hook up to them. So fellows built Adopt a Hydrant, which lets citizens sign up and take care of a hydrant that's near them, right? So when there's a snowstorm, the app notifies everybody, they grab their shovel, they dig out the hydrant, and the problem is solved, right? So Adopt a Hydrant has been redeployed uh, in places like in Honolulu. They turned it into Adopt a Siren for tsunami sirens. They do the same kind of thing. They have citizens sort of help them test tsunami sirens. It's been deployed in a bunch of other cities, basically adopt some kind of civic infrastructure. Um, but I think the fellowship program doesn't scale very well, and that's where kind of the brigade program comes in, right? It's more of a grassroots, uh, it's, it's local communities of civic and technology-minded people who just want to make our cities better, right? No problem or project is too big or too small as long as we can kind of rally around it. So some of our 2012 projects included a uh, wildfire tracking app. Whenever the Oklahoma wildfires were going on, we got data from NASA. We had a mobile app to see like health inspection scores for restaurants that are near you. Um, okay, this is my favorite. A code for Tulsa group helped upgrade this Tulsa Fire Department dispatch system, which is basically a Zetron radio and a dot matrix printer straight out of Back to the Future. <laughs> so the coders jammed a Raspberry Pi onto the Zetron radio uh, which parsed radio data, uploaded it to a server, it sent text messages to firefighters at the station, and then linked back to a jQuery mobile app that had maps to the dispatch location along with data about the fire hydrants around it, like what valve types they are in size and flow rate and all that kind of, kind of stuff. So this was definitely the coolest app I think that we've done. Um, it collects, you know, it had hundreds of users among the firefighters union and a bunch of their spouses actually. Um, so these kind of projects earned us a real hacker's reputation um, with our fellow brigades. Like we don't always build the prettiest apps, but we can sure abuse technology to make it do what we want. Um, we reach outside of code every once in a while, so we help to draft an open data policy with Tulsa City Council. Um, they unanimously, unanimously approved it. The mayor signed it shortly afterwards. Um, that made us like one of only a handful of cities that had such a policy and probably the only one written by code monkeys. Um, for last year's National Day of Civic Hacking, we were organizing a Tulsa Wiki edit-a-thon and a brigade meetup and a civic tech expo, all this stuff to happen at the library. Uh, and then the tornado hit more Oklahoma. So none of us were here, but obviously we all have you know, friends and family around the area. And uh, it was a pretty like, tough week leading up to organizing a big you know, national event type thing. Um, but the National Day organizers actually reached out to us to see if we could help responders to, to the tornado, right? Uh, so through them and with our Tulsa Fire Department connections, we got to meet with this guy, Terry Sivanon. He is in, uh, the, he's the Oklahoma Task Force One leader who had actually just got back from 
more like you know the day before. Uh, so we talked to him for about an hour, and then we went on to our like kind of regularly scheduled programming. Um, but from that talk, we uh, mostly John Dungan, who's in our group, worked on a mobile search map for disaster responders who deploy and operate in the field. So it recorded searches like online in real time, where before they had been doing this with paper and pencil on a, a main station, right, that everyone had to check in at. So that project actually scored us an invitation to the White House Champions of Change in July, um, where we got a chance to meet Jen Polka, who was serving as the deputy CTO uh, of the country, I guess, at the White House. Um, and as it turns out, she actually has family in Tulsa. So that was cool to talk to her for a while. Um, Scott Phillips told her about our Raspberry Pi hack, um, and both she and Tim O'Reilly like shared it on Google Plus, and that was really cool, like more hacker reputation, right? Um, so we went into the White House. Scott spoke at the Champions of Change panel for civic hackers like us. Uh, a few months later, we officially joined Code for America Brigade. So John and I went um, to the Code for America Summit in San Francisco. We connected with a bunch of other brigades across the country. We got those snazzy track jackets. Um, <laughs> this year, we advised city IT staff to launch Tulsa's open data portal. And we're building some tools on top of that. Uh, we've had a couple events to edit Tulsa on OpenStreetMap. We combined our 2014 like Code Across Hackathon with TU. Uh, they have every year they have a service hackathon, and uh, we recently collaborated with a group called Tulsa Now uh, to make zoningcases.com. It lets you look up uh, building, planning, and zoning changes around you. And we just got back from the 2014 Code for America Summit. And this time, Code for America and Tulsa Community Foundation paid for five of us to go, uh, including Carlos and John Whitlock, who are here. Um, at uh, this year's summit, there was actually a special meetup for brigades from the Midwest. So we met with uh, folks from Kansas City and Omaha and Chicago and those kinds of cities. Uh, and we're talking, especially with Kansas City, about making some trips between you know, some of the more regional brigades. OK, so what does the web have to do with all this? So first of all, like, it struck me that none of this was, is even possible without the web. right? Like Our first civic project in Hack Day, we didn't even have code. Like, we just had web browsers. right? That's, that's all we did. We went on the web, and we went and found the information that we needed to because it was there on the web. right? Um, we didn't have to sign up. Your develop we didn't have to sign up for your developer program. We didn't have to go you know, sign a non-disclosure agreement or stuff. It was just on the web. We don't have to deal with any of that other crap. For us, it's also faster to get projects into people's hands. Um, like with web services like GitHub, Amazon, Heroku, all that stuff, we can like, collaborate, we can code, we can publish immediately to a URL. Um, you know, some of our setups are more complicated. Don't ask John about getting Postgres running on Heroku. It is a challenge. Um, but the whole process can typically take like two or three minutes from the time that we want to make a code change to the time that it is in somebody's mobile phone, right? Uh, and yeah, compare that to like 18 steps you have to do for a Google Play app submission or you know the 11-day iOS app store approval time kind of thing, right? Um, which is the other thing that, that with the web, there's no gatekeepers like. Google or Apple can just reject apps for any reason they want, from like a small typo type error to big issues like you're competing with their business products, right? Um, and on top of that, they're all constantly fighting each other, right? So we don't want to have to navigate this proverbial hissy fit of giant corporations, right, with more money than common sense. We just want to help our fellow citizens, right? We just want to get this stuff to our fellow citizens. So more than anything, that's, that's why I like the web, right? And that's why I find it really inspiring, is it's the only space where anyone can reach everyone, right? Um, with the web, innovation can come from anywhere, like a web developer in Oklahoma jabbing a Raspberry Pi into his e-tron radio, right? Like a Mozilla, our mission is to protect this sort of openness and innovation and opportunity on the web, right? It's, it's like an abstract mission, and it's, but it's based on very specific beliefs, right? We believe in principle over profit, that secrecy is trumped by honesty, corporate interests by community, but most importantly, we believe in you, right? Like, we believe the web is made possible by programmers, engineers, designers, 
creative people like just like you who give time, talent, energy for a good cause, um, and that together like we can all innovate for the you know the benefit of the individual and the betterment of the web, so that it always serves the greater good, right? Like this. So remember these guys. Uh, this year they pled guilty to three counts of first degree murder and two counts of shooting with intent to kill. So prosecutors say that they targeted blacks because England's father was a Cherokee Indian killed by a black man in 2010. So their story actually reminded me of my favorite civic app called Stop Beef. Uh, it was made by this guy, Travis Laurendine in New Orleans. Um, on Mother's Day in 2013, there was a high profile shooting that injured like 19 people over there. Uh, so of course it was called the Mother's Day shootings and you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so he asked a friend from the New Orleans rap community, Skip Nicholas, like what, what could we do about this? So he learned that most of the murders in New Orleans start from these things called beefs, right? It's small conflicts between a couple of guys that somebody disrespects somebody else, there's retaliation, it grows and grows and grows, and eventually there's just violence, right? So Stop Beef lets parents and siblings and others like report beefs uh, when and where they see them, and then it notifies like teachers, pastors, local rap celebrities are into it, people that can go and sort of arbitrate the beef before it turns into violence, right? Now, that's a cool app, right? So he says in a world where there's apps for someone to come do your laundry for you, you know, we have more important problems to solve. Uh, and so here's the point. As we practice software development, we learn that we developers have like this incredible amount of potential to change the world, right? Like the things that we do with technology seem like superpowers to other people, right? If they don't understand it, it's just magic. So if I can give you only one message today, it's the message from Voltaire, but also Spider-Man. Um, <laughs> with great power comes great responsibility, right? Like, we, we're not gonna, you may not save the world, but our knowledge as programmers can make a real difference in it, right? The web enables us to make things that scale instantly from a few of our friends to millions or even billions of people, right? So with that, Matt's gonna come up here. Matt Chandler, um, we're going to officially announce Matt has offered, volunteered to lead and start a Code for OKC Brigade. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, you know, Luke approached us probably a month ago to get this started, and, and we finally got around to doing it, announcing it here. It's going to be October 27th at Prototech at 6 p.m., so we want as many people to come out, learn. We're going to talk about some of the projects that, uh, that people have pitched, um, and follow us on Twitter. Code for OKC. I'm about to tweet this picture out as the first tweet, so uh, uh, we look forward to, to seeing as many people who want to get involved with this. Uh, you don't have to be a programmer. Uh, all kinds of people will be there, civic people, designers, hardware hackers, programmers, and uh, come hit me up. I'll be here all day uh, walking around. Come talk to me. I'd love to talk to, uh, talk to you about civic hacking and, and ideas you have. and and uh, look forward to seeing you. So we're at 18, I have 18 minutes on my clock. Do we have time for questions? Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Just tell me when, when our time is up. So I guess questions for any Matt or me. There's also more Code for Tulsa folks here, so yep. So I'm curious, since you guys in Tulsa have been doing this for, for a while, um, and you're largely building these applications and these tools and you know hacking hardware together in your kind of your spare time, how do you keep it running? Or have you have you run into problems with that like over the longer term of like, you know, this this uh, weekday hack that you did, all of a sudden yep. someone's depending on it and then they come back and you said, Well, it broke because you know all things break. Yep. Yeah, okay, so I'll tell you a, a, a funny story. Um, <laughs> so whenever we did the firefighter app, I, uh, the text notifications were going through my personal Twilio account. That was fine, like we got like $80 worth of credit from Twilio donated. Um, 
And then after it had been out there for three or four weeks, uh, I got a bill for $200 from Twilio. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't seem right. And then I got another bill for $100. And so we called the fire department. We were like, oh my gosh, like who's, it was this one like new like rookie that had just graduated from the fire academy and he had subscribed to like every single station. <laughs> so like every single dispatch was being sent to him. So in that case, like, you know, we, we, we had to bite the bullet and just pay it. But that, that, that is like kind of what happens is, you know, a lot of these things we build and like we can do it for free with Heroku has enough free stuff or we can, you can get away with a lot for free. Most of the time that's all we need, like because this thing either doesn't take off or it only has a few users and a free thing is fine. At that point we're just kind of demonstrating the concept. We're just proving like we can go and talk about civic tech all, all we want at city council meetings. It wasn't until I took my phone out and put tfdd.co on it and showed it to a city councilor and then light bulb, right? Like they don't, they don't get the talk, but as soon as you can take everything you're talking about and put it in somebody's hand and show them what technology can do, like that has been mostly what we've been doing, right? Is just proving it out. Um, having said that, we're definitely at that point now in Tulsa where we're seeing the limits of what volunteers can do. Like whenever, whenever one of these things gets popular, now, it's, now we're scrambling, now it's falling over, now people are having to go over to a fire department and plug in the Raspberry Pi again because some, somebody kicked it out or something, right? Like, so yeah, there's definitely a limit that you hit with an all-volunteer effort, and that's going a lot on in a lot of Code for America brigades too. And so Code for America, the national org, is trying to figure out how do we make these brigades sustainable? Do, is it foundation funding? Is it, is, do, you, do they try and build a civic app as a startup and make their own money? Or you know, how does all that work out? But, so that's where we are. OK, I have a question. Um, so you built a lot of apps so far. Um, as you look over all the apps that's been completed by you and other uh, Code for America projects, what sort of skills and talents and just general things to know do you find crop up more often than others? And if someone wanted to get started, they could learn those and get a jump start to making things quickly. Uh, GIS and geo <laughs> is absolutely the number one thing. So the, 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 the going wisdom, I think it's Noel, the guy in New York, basically says that brigades have to have three people. You have to have hackers and yackers and mappers, right? And the hackers code and we love to code. Yakers love to like talk in front of city council and talk to you know community organizers and social groups, and then the mappers have all the GIS data. Like they they have the data, they know how to use it, they know how to translate projections and all that kind of stuff. So if there's a technical skill that you want to add to do to do this kind of stuff, it's definitely GIS and geo type stuff. Um, outside of that, you know we we experiment with all the stuff that people do. Like you know people are checking out. Angular and Ember and Grunt and you know a bunch of JavaScript frameworks or uh, it's really just the rest of it is just web stuff. Okay, one more. Nope. Okay, we're at time. So thanks. Uh, get a hold of Matt.